You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. That's the great thing about sports. You play to win. And I don't care if you don't have any wins. You go play to win. When you start telling me it doesn't matter, then retire. Get out. Because it matters. Well, good morning, good people. Mark Hulk here, of course, with my buddy Cowboy Joe Blue. And as always, I want to thank you guys for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Blue Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know this literally does not work. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so we can get you up to speed with all of the news on the Dallas Cowboys and program. No, don't forget, we'll be live streaming tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern, like we've been doing since 2016. That's a long time. Eight years. Eight freaking years of Monday and Friday nights. But we'll be bringing here always at 9 p.m. And in the meantime, it's the off season, yes. But in football, there really is no off season. Understanding that we've just officially hired Mike Zimmer this week, he's got to fill out a staff and get to work immediately on who is going to be here. I don't know if most people realize that when we say the off season, the league year starts on the 13th of March. Let me say that again. The 13th of March begins the league year. On the 11th, you can start talking to free agents about who you want to start making contracts with. Legal tampering, so to speak. On the 20th, the 20th, you can begin the process of franchise tagging players for the next then two weeks. The last week of the month is the combine where, of course, all of the next generation of players will be there working out, figuring out who's who and what's what. So there is no off time here. And for us as Cowboy fans, we actually have a lot of work to do and are a bit behind the curve. Having Mike Zimmer here, the question now begs is, who is he going to get to fill in the staff? Uh, we know there was a phone call that was uh, a call that was coming in during his press conference, and he says somebody calling about a job. But we do have a passing game coordinator, a defensive line uh, positions that are definitely open. And there's a guy out there who got released, surprisingly, um, Steve Wilkes. Um, that's one of those head scratchers, and of course they say they, they felt they needed to go in a different direction, uh, even though their defense was actually better than the year before, and the guy had only been here one year. But we'll get back to that in a few minutes. The question now is, we have free agents. We have a lot that are actually on the defense. And later today, I'm going to be getting together with my, my buddy, Game Time Brian, the mailman. The mailman isn't delivering mail today. He's going to be helping to deliver some news on the Dallas Cowboys. What we have to figure out here is the Dallas Cowboys, what kind of direction are they going to go as far as their free agents? And we have 16 of them. Guys like Dante Fowler, um, our, our, our free agent, Stephon Gilmore. Um, I've, I've got the whole, I don't have the whole list in my head right now, but we have quite a few that, uh, Dorrance Armstrong is another one, um, Navel Gallimore, that are on the defense, and we have to figure out, are these guys we want to bring back, or are these guys that we want to go ahead and let go and change what we're looking at here? This may actually be to the benefit of the Cowboys that so many of these guys are, in fact, our free agents. But so here's what I realize here, and... I've kind of said this a couple of times, but the Dallas Cowboys with Dan Quinn, Dan Quinn's philosophy, and I don't have to play that clip anymore, after the Super Bowl, he had a philosophy of fast and physical. Fast and physical. You know, we're going to be attacking, we're going to be fast, we're going to be physical. And he, th this is also meshes with the Cowboys where they like length, they like taller guys. Okay, taller guys, taller guys that are fast. Okay, because if you're a pass rusher, that speed is deadly going against the offensive line, which is not a bad thing. The problem is when you're fast and physical and you have length, you're kind of light in the ass. Okay, I am 5'10 right now. 
510 and um, pushing the high 260s. Okay. 510, I want you, 510, pushing about the 260s, okay? I got, I got some belly. I, I'll admit that. I got some belly. You know, I got broad shoulders and, and the chest and stuff. Now, when you get more length, that kind of skins this stuff out. So I was going through the size of the Cowboys, and it's the sixes. Everybody is 6'2 or more. And this is crazy because I want you to think about this, okay? Now, I'm about 268. So here's what we've got. Micah Parsons is six foot three. He's five inches taller than me, but he's about 23 pounds less. He's 245. He's fast. He is very physical, but he's lean. Um, Damone Clark. Linebacker for us. Six foot three, 240. Again, another skinny pole. D Law. This one actually I'm surprised because I thought he was about 280. D Law is six foot three, 265. He's three pounds less than me, but five inches taller. Osa Indigazua. Six foot two. He's one of the big boys for us at 280. Sam Williams, six foot four, 261. Which, now, now let, me, let me preface it this. For a defensive end, that's about the size that you want. About 6'4". Same thing with D-Law. That's about the size. Maybe a little bit bigger. You know, if you can get to be like the 270 but still move, you know, that, that's okay. But the, the size, let me be clear here. The size of D-Law and um, Sam Williams is not terrible. It's really the interior defensive lineman. Hankins is the big boy on the unit. He's 6'2", 320. Um, Goldston. This one, wow, Goldston, six foot five, two sixty-eight. That's really skinny. Dante Fowler, six foot three, two sixty-one. He'll probably go to Washington. Um, Novell Gallimore. He's about the closest thing to a fire hydrant that we have. Six two three oh two. And then Mozzie Smith is listed at six three. Was 337, but we hear that he's around, he's under the 300 range. So here's my thing, my personal opinion. And the difference with what Mike Zimmer's going to want to do is Mike Zimmer likes to have two big fat guys that are um, typically shaded inside of the guard. And when I say shaded, this is straight up. Shaded means you're going to one side or the other. So when you say the term shaded, you shade a little to the left or you shade a little to the right. But typically, he'll have his tackles shaded a little bit towards the center. Two big guys that are like fire hydrants. And when I say fire hydrants, fire hydrants are low to the ground and they're an immovable force. And typically... Guys that are shorter and heavier. And the thing about being long and skinny is you've got to bend more to get down low. You have a higher center of gravity. And so it's easier to be rooted out. The Dallas Cowboys, incredible pass rushers. Not disputing that. Because all of these guys, for their sizes, are very, very fast. The problem is... If you've got defensive tackles that are 280 and they're getting double teamed and then you've got linebackers that are safety, you're too small. You're like little league kids out there versus the big guys. And this is the problem for the Cowboys. This is why the Cowboys are great during the regular season, beating up on lesser teams. Their speed can just overwhelm them. But when you get to the playoffs... 
when things are yards are harder to come by, teams rely on the run more. And if you notice the Cowboys, every time we played the Buffaloes, we played the 49ers, we played actually the Eagles the first time, teams that can run the football were a problem. So this is a fundamental sea change that we are going to have to make to fit with Mike Zimmer's defense. And we're going to need to get some experience at linebacker. When you look at the Dallas Cowboys, just go ahead and Google Dallas Cowboys linebackers. What you'll see is you'll see Micah Parsons, who we've been using as an edge rusher, and you'll see Damone Clark. That's it. That's the list of Dallas Cowboys linebackers. The fact that you only have two guys and one of them is actually on the line says a lot about this defense of where they're lacking. You can point to the Dallas, to Dak Prescott and the offense and all that stuff and, and Mike McCarthy, but the reality is, is this philosophical idea of how we're going to do our defense was our downfall. If we were a team that was always going to be in the league, then hey, we're great. Because if we can make you one-dimensional where we know we can pin our ears back, we've got the horses in the race that can go. But this is where being a shorter guy, fatter guy, are harder to get out. We had a JMU. Oh, my goodness. Um, I wonder what he would have been had he not passed. We had a guy from Tidewater, Virginia. Doug West. It was hell for me in practice because I was like 220. Five foot ten and a half and 220. Doug was about 5'10 and a half like me, but was about 310 pounds. And it was, <laughs> I always hated the beginning of practice because we did what was called form tackle. And basically you paired up. And what you did was you wrapped around, you know, boom, wrapped around, you, you know, arched your back, picked them up, and you carried him for 10 yards. For Doug carrying me, it was easy. You try picking up a guy who's 320 pounds and carrying him for 10 yards. You try that. It ain't easy. And the thing about it is, is when you are compacted like that and you have that kind of mass, and you are lower to the ground because at six foot four, you're only bending down so far. At five foot ten, you're getting even lower. It's more of an immovable force, and you're more able to be like a battle tank. That when that double team comes, when that guard or the guard in the center are trying to push you out, when you are trying to split the double team and drop the anchor. You're closer to the ground, and you have more weight underneath of you to fall. And this is where the Cowboys can change and make a difference in stopping the run. And understand that football, regular season is regular season. Playoff football is a different animal. And even with as great as Pat Mahomes is, Pacheco being able to run the football is making a difference for that offense. With the 49ers, of course, with Christian McCaffrey, running the football is the best friend of Brock Purdy's. And the Cowboys, the same problems the Cowboys have had for the longest time is stopping the run and running the football when it comes to bad weather. Now, for me, I still think that the Cowboys, I don't know if they have or not. I don't know if Steve Wilkes is going to say, I'm just going to take a year off and wait for a uh, defensive coordinator job or if he's actually going to take a lesser one. Probably the most profile one that's left out there and probably one of the higher jobs would be passing game coordinator for the Cowboys um, would be advantageous, especially if you start thinking about a revenge factor for Steve Wilkes. Let's listen into ESPN before we get out of here about that topic. Just days after losing the Super Bowl, firing their defensive coordinator, Steve Wilkes, who was there just one season. In a conference call with reporters, Kyle Shanahan said he realized, quote, going a different direction was something I have to do. 
San Francisco will now be looking for its third defensive coordinator in as many seasons. That because D'Amico Ryans uh, parlayed the job he did last year into a head coaching job, and he did magnificently well. But the reality is Wilkes had a better year this year than Ryans had had the previous year. Look at the numbers. I mean, everything on that right-hand column looks better. And in the Super Bowl, the 49ers only allowed one touchdown to Patrick Mahomes in regulation, and that came immediately after that crazy punt play that hit the guy in the foot. What I'm trying to say is, as we bring our football crew in, you see Tim Hasselbeck, Harry Douglas, and here's my man Damian Woody. Steve Wilkes is by no means, the defense is by no means the reason they lost the Super Bowl on Sunday. What do you think of this move? I was shocked, Granny. When, when, when I saw Shepter tweeted that, it like, like my jaw dropped because I saw the job that Steve Wilkes had done with his defense. We know that there's been like a lineage of defensive coordinators that's come through and has done a, a tremendous job mm -hmm. uh, with, with the San Francisco 49ers defense. And yes, he doesn't run the exact same scheme that Robert Sala and D'Amico Ryans run, but obviously with the numbers that you showed, he did better, better. than what D'Amico Ryans did the prior, the prior two years. And when I, look at, when I look at this whole year, especially in the Super Bowl, where were those five all pro offensive players on, on offense for the San Francisco 49ers? Mm -hmm. Okay, the genius, the genius play calling Kyle Shanahan. What, ha what happened to those guys? Again, just like you pointed out, this uh, San Francisco 49ers defense only gave up one touchdown, and that was after a muff punt, what we call, you know, like after a turnover. Yeah. So the fact that you're going to relieve the defensive coordinator of his duty, it just feels to me that Kyle Shanahan doesn't get it. Where is the where is the accountability on his part as far as why he keeps falling short in these big moments? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Steve Wilkes is not the one who didn't use his timeouts at the end of the second quarter in the Super Bowl. Steve Wilkes is not the one who called eight runs on nine play calls at the beginning of the third quarter when he had a chance to take over the game. Steve Wilkes, to my knowledge, is not the one who said, hey, let's take the ball if we win the coin toss in overtime, even though every person walking the face of planet Earth knows that's a terrible decision. So one way or another, Steve Wilkes had a better day on Sunday than his boss did, and his boss fired him yesterday. What do you it's think of that, crazy. Harry Douglas? Uh, I think it's terrible. I was appalled. I was also disappointed. When you look at that Super Bowl game, it wasn't Steve Wilkes on the first drive offensively. Uh, it was Christian McCaffrey that fumbled that football. It wasn't Steve Wilkes that missed the extra point that would have put the Kansas City Chiefs probably in a different situation towards uh, regulation. That was Jake Moody. Also, it was not Steve Wilkes who was on offense after getting two turnovers and couldn't score one point off of those turnovers and actually had the ball coming out of halftime at the interception at the 44-yard line of the Kansas City Chiefs and couldn't get any points. So we're sitting up here watching Steve Wilkes get scapegoated again, and this is the third time, Greeny. That's why I'm kind of fired up about this. In Arizona, he was a mm -hmm. head coach for one year. They let him go. In Carolina, after Matt Rule did a terrible job, it was Steve Wilkes that brought positivity to the Carolina Panthers. They gave the ball to uh, the, the coaching job to Frank Wright only to fire him a year later and now we see this in San Francisco just doesn't make sense to me and if for Kyle Shanahan if you felt like from a schematic standpoint that he wasn't the guy wouldn't you review that before you hire him for the job that's just my logic and my thinking yeah if, if the defense he runs is not the defense that Robert Sala and D'Amico Ryan's run that shouldn't have come as a surprise uh, right. That's not something that you find out halfway through the season. You look up and say, wait a minute, this isn't the defensive scheme that we've been running all these years. Mm -hmm. That was fairly evident beforehand. Uh, Steve Wilkes has been around the league forever. Tim Hasselbeck, what do you make of all this? Yeah, I don't know what else can be said, to be honest with you. I agree with the guys on this one. And um, look, I, I think that, you know, to Harry's point, the job that Steve Wilkes did in Carolina in some ways was remarkable. There are a lot of people that thought that they would maybe get the job. He would become the head coach there because of the job that he did. And so, look, this does not feel like a production thing whatsoever. We had the full screen up to start this segment. Like, the production was there. The defense was really good. And so, uh, you know, I think as you look at this, it's hard to make sense of it. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's a scapegoat thing, if it's a it's personality a thing, thing, but the reality is, like, for Steve Wilkes, uh, it's also a bad timing thing because because he did a good job, because he's getting let go at this point, there aren't landing spots at this stage of the hiring this process. Where it could be Cowboys having a For a guy that was a defensive coordinator that just coordinated a pretty good defense in a Super Bowl. So 
Look, I think it's bad at every level, and, and I don't really know what else you can end up saying about it. I think that's exactly right. I, I hadn't thought of that part of it, but that actually is the ultimate um, punctuation on the conversation. I mean, Steve Wilkes, where is he going to turn now? You're going right. to wind up. Someone will hire him, obviously, because he's an extremely well-known, well-respected coach around the league. He'll get a job, but certainly all of the ones that someone like him would want, one would think, have been taken by now. The, the whole thing just doesn't sit well, right? I, look, I mean, they can make whatever decisions they want with their coaching staff. I'm not here to tell them what they should and shouldn't or could and couldn't do. But this one just does not seem to pass the smell test. Yeah, it, it reeks to me. And I think Harry brought up, you know, his points about the, the, his previous stops, particularly with the Carolina Panthers, the yeah. job he did as an interim. A lot They're of people did think four. that he was going to get the head coach job only to not get in. Then Frank Wright gets And then he gets fired during the season the, the, the following year. Uh, it, again, the job that, that Steve Wilkes d had done with the with the San Francisco 49ers this year well, it was a really remarkable job. He doesn't run the same scheme as those prior two defensive coordinators, but nonetheless, he had a tremendous year. And to fire a defensive coordinator that was literally coaching in the Super Bowl, it just makes you scratch your head. And I, I just... Yeah, I feel for the guy because, again, the hiring cycle is, is basically over and all the, all the defensive coordinator jobs are filled. Yeah, the hiring cycle is over. It turns out the firing cycle still had one more move story in Kansas. There you go. So, the Cowboys, this is an opportunity to get a little more intel on your competition and bring in a guy who has been, uh, you know, really, really good. So we'll see if anything happens from that. Um, I know a lot of people are on that same bandwagon of getting that guy in here, but we'll see. That's all I can tell you. Okay, good people. That's all I got for you right now. Be looking for me in game time later on. Uh, basically talking about all these free agents that we have. Should they stay or should they go? I'm Mark Holmes, and I appreciate you guys. Peace out.